A key educational technology are virtual learning environments, most commonly referred to as learning management systems, but essentially they are set up to provide support for the teaching and learning process. Um, and they involve a range of different capabilities, such as being able to collect assignments, and present content, um, conduct quizzes, those sorts of things. And there's a number of the, uh, the common uh, platforms, uh, Blackboard, um, Canvas, Moodle, uh, Google Classroom, Apple Classroom. So there's a range of different environments that are provided to support student learning. Now, what I'd like you to do is to have a look at the range of available learning management systems or virtual learning environments and compare some of the different characteristics that we will discuss in the tutorials. Have a look at some of the free ones and even try them out. Uh, pick a couple and see what processes are involved in setting up a virtual learning environment. So you should see from examining the range of different um, learning environments that the majority of them have a similar set of characteristics, a similar set of um, applications and tools that are used to support students' learning and teachers in their teaching processes. So some of the key co components are the content management system. Um, essentially, Many learning management systems are around restricting access to content to only students enrolled in particular courses, particularly when these environments are used for paid tuition. Um, so only students enrolled in a subject or in a course would have access to the particular um, learning experiences managed by the learning management system. Not all learning management systems utilize that. Some are, are much more open and it's more than about providing access, um, normally through a web interface, that allows students to engage with course material. But it looks after the files and um, permissions related to those files. Then we have what's called curriculum mapping and planning. This is how we structure the learning activities into some sort of sequence or grouping that allow the learner to work through and engage with the content. Um, this can be very stringently constrained, a bit like in this course, where you step through and are only allowed access to course material at certain times and after having completed previous course material. Other environments are much more open where uh, the students can just pick and choose from various learning activities and experiences and manage their own learning processes. So it has a lot to do with the pedagogy and the framing of um, what's called the locus of control. Is it teacher-centred or student-centred? Um, learning management systems by their nature tend to be teacher-centred, where they're structured around students progressing through some learning experiences that a teacher or an instructional designer or lecturer has pre-established with very little student choice in the process. But that's by no means the only way that these tools can be used. It just seems to be a common default um, because the tools tend to allow that capability uh, that tends to engender an environment that promotes that sort of thinking about pedagogy. But it's a relatively um, outdated pedagogical approach. There are much more effective and efficient pedagogies where students have got a lot more control over the decision-making processes of what they learn and when they learn and how they learn it. But very few learning management systems have developed um, to support that style. There's been a few attempts, but unfortunately they tend to uh, revert to type as they become more popular. They become, they involve more and more of the traditional learning management tools and structures and philosophies and tend to devolve or evolve, depending on your point of view into a more traditional learning management um, corporate type learning environment. Then there's also the learner engagement and administration tools. So these are attempts to actually engage learners. Now often this is a, again from a teacher or, or institution perspective where it's around trying to ensure that the students participate in a course, track their um, use of and access to various 
uh, learning activities. And again, it's a very um, managed process. It's not to say that's the only way that it can be done though. There are ways in which we can actually give the students the capability to manage their own learning, to track their own progress, how they're progressing, how they're, um, what activities they're finding most effective in their learning and allowing students to have a choice of a range of different activities and build that capability to manage their own learning processes. Then there's their communication and collaboration capabilities of the learning management systems, where we communicate to students. And again, that can often be a institution or teacher directed approach, or it can be a way of facilitating communication between students. Uh, the most so the most extreme example of this would be the open MOOCs um, or where the students actually build the course as they go collaboratively. A very different approach to most um, institutional uses of learning management systems where often the entire course is prepared beforehand and regardless of who the students are, um, they just enroll in the course and progress through it. Um, and all of the decisions made about the course were done well and truly before any students enrolled. So by very nature, it hasn't been tailored to suit particular students. And then there's the facilities for real-time communication, such as video conferencing and audio conferencing, and being able to collaborate and with the um, instructors, but also with other students, and to build a community of learning so these are the main characteristics of a virtual learning environment. Then we have some trends of where learning management systems and virtual learning environments are progressing. I've sort of talked a little bit about some of these, but there are a range of sort of um, movements within the development of virtual learning environments. The first being towards the mobile and the idea that we can access course material anywhere at any time. So there's been quite a lot of effort put into making content available on different formats. So a student can access their learning management system through their mobile phone or through their desktop or through um, a tablet or even in some cases through virtual learning environments, through, uh, through virtual reality and other virtual spaces. So this can very much change how we design the activities that students are going to be engaging with. Now, part of your um, hybrid, hybrid um, learning activity um, task is to consider how your learning activity can be accessed through different learning environments. Um, can it be accessed through a mobile device? Can it be accessed through virtual reality or augmented reality? Um, is it going to be embedded within a learning management system or virtual learning environment? Or is it going to be um, made available, say, on through social media or a range of different ways of accessing the learning experiences that you're creating as part of your hybrid learning experience activity. So another aspect of virtual learning environments is the degree to which they focus on personalization and what we call adaptive learning, where the learning management system, um, again, it's often pre-prepared, so this happens naturally when a teacher is engaging with a student um, and they'll often adjust things depending upon how quickly and easily the student is learning um, material or if they're having difficulties they may present them with different types of material or if they're going through it really quickly they may um, have some more what we call extension material or other um, learning activities that extend what they're um, going through. But in a virtual environment this is often pre-planned. So and we call these adaptive learning experiences. So if a student um, learns some material and then they're given a quiz, if they do really well on the quiz, then we may present them with some more difficult material. If they don't do it all well, then we may present them with material that revises and goes back over the material that they've just learnt. So it adapts to the um, capabilities of the student. Now, some of these can become quite advanced and with artificial intelligence technologies being brought into play, they can track an understanding of students' capabilities to a high degree and modify the learning experience 
um, to meet the needs of the learner in the most effective way. Then we have a concept called gamification. We'll be exploring this in later weeks, but essentially it's using uh, some motivational techniques and affordances we see in computer games that engage students or engage people, players, uh, with the computer game uh, very effectively. And some of those techniques can be applied into an educational setting where we can have things such as scores and um, rankings and various other psychological techniques to capture the engagement of a, of a student and keep them wanting to learn and to progress in their learning. Then we have what's called social learning, which is trying to incorporate a whole range of learning experiences that are involved in our communication with others. Now, a lot of this has come through social media and what we've learned through experiences where people learn using those platforms, but also platforms such as uh, YouTube, where a lot of people, a lot of people now have YouTube as one of their go-to points when they need to learn something new. Um, and likewise, if they're wanting to learn something, they may ask their friends or their social media um, followers how to approach learning something. So these techniques are being incorporated into virtual learning environments. Then we've also got the analytics and data-driven approach. One of the great things activity and learning object, whether or not they stop an activity and will exit the learning management system um, at certain points and then try to work out why, what was frustrating or what disengaged them from the learning experience that caused them to stop using it at that point. So lots and lots of data, particularly around assessment. So part of that is used to um, individualize and contextualize the learning experience, but we can also use it to look at trends around enrollments and engagement, trying to ensure that students don't drop out of courses, which is a big focus in higher education. Then we've got another concept called open education resources and indeed the open education movement. This is around making resources freely available for others to use. And so you can then choose from a whole range of existing material and plug that straight into your learning or virtual learning environment and construct a learning experience from activities that others have prepared. Now this is becoming more and more popular, uh, particularly in the third world where they have uh, more and more challenges around developing high quality learning experiences. And it's been probably most popularized by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, um, which had quite a focus on making their learning experiences freely available for other institutions and indeed individuals to engage with. Then we've got integration with other environments. Um, part of this is a thing called single sign-on where there may be a whole range of tools that we utilize in an organization, in a university or in a school, and we don't want our students to have to have a different sign-on process to use all of the different tools. So there'd be a single process whereby they sign on once, and then all of the different tools recognize them and can also share data between those different tools. So in our case, what's happening in Teams can be shared with what's happening in Canvas and what's happening in the grade management system and in the enrollment system. And so all of this data is being shared uh, with the hopeful intent of improving the learning experience. And then finally, we've got a concept called hybridization. Now we had a period of time where um, on-campus learning was distinguished from online learning and it was considered sort of two different types of learning. And then over time, these virtual learning environments were used for both types of learning. And as the virtual learning environments became used more and more, we, we saw that the two types of learning weren't that different. And indeed, they were often using the same resources and the same activities and much of the same experiences. And so a new approach has been explored called hybrid learning, where we combine online learning and face-to-face -face learning and have those occur as part of the same learning experience. So one approach to this is to have screens around a physical learning space where students studying virtually from their homes, for example, can see the students on campus and the students on campus can see the students 
studying virtually and can interact with one another. And so they can do the same activities. They can all interact with the, the teacher, the academic, the instructor. And the experience can be combined in what we call a hybrid learning experience.